Hey everyone, Robin from Backscatter here. And in part five of our best settings for the Olympus TG6 video series, we're breaking down the advanced settings. Not all the settings and tips that we're about to cover are complicated. Some of them are among the most basic settings in this camera, but this is our chance to just really nerd out and go deep into the menus to explore every option. These aren't really the kind of things that you need to know for your first dive. Rather, these are really for dialing in your shooting preferences and making sure you know how to get the absolute most out of using the TG6 underwater. These settings don't quite fit into our on the boat and in the water format from the other videos, so instead, we're just gonna run through these in order from coolest to easiest to nerdiest. So let's dive in. One of the most helpful features of the TG6 are the two custom assignable modes. This is where you start to make the jump from just shooting a camera to shooting your camera. You can program every shooting setting, except for the zoom level, to either of these two custom modes. You want to easily switch from your wide angle settings to your macro settings with just one click? Well, there you go. Once you're in the mode that you want to assign and you have all of your settings dialed in, just bring up the main menu, go to shooting menu one, reset assign custom modes, select C1 or C2, and then set. Then back out of the menu, rotate the mode dial to that custom position and confirm that all of your settings are there. If you need to make any in the water settings adjustments within that custom mode, go ahead. Don't worry about losing your custom settings. You can always get right back to your assigned preset by just rotating out of the custom mode and back to it, or by turning the camera off and on again. We can activate focus peaking to see the sharpest part of the shot outlined on the screen in a contrasting color and we can use the focus lock feature to avoid quick in and out focus hunts while we're recording video. This slightly more sophisticated focus method pretty much only applies to video shooting because shooting photos really just needs that quick half press to autofocus, maybe recompose and then capture the shot. When you're shooting video on the TG6, the camera is going to attempt to continuously automatically update the focus based on whatever is in the center of the frame. Now for like 90% of video shots, this is totally fine and it works really well and it's exactly how we would shoot it. In some situations though, such as when you have a lot of moving elements in a wide angle scene or maybe a macro subject that's like darting closer and farther away from the camera, the camera is going to have a harder time keeping focus set in one place. This is going to result in these little focus hunts. Now, even when these focus hunts happen, they can be so minor that you can just live with them, but sometimes they can be downright clip killers. So we're going to break down the focus technique that we like for advanced video shooting. That's going to give us maximum focus control and avoid this kind of thing happening. Let's start with the focus peaking. Focus peaking is going to outline the sharpest part of the frame on the screen in a separate contrasting color, making it easy to quickly tell exactly where your focus is set. Turn this on by going into the main menu, going to the custom menu, then page A, MF assist, and turn peaking on. Then you want to head to page B and set the peaking color to red because that's going to be the easiest color for us to see underwater. Here's the catch about focus peaking. It only works in the manual focus mode. The thing is, the TG6 is so dang good and fast at autofocusing, we really never want to have to sacrifice that feature by switching over to the manual focus mode and dealing with a much slower, clunkier style of operation. So instead, we're going to use the focus lock technique to get the best of both of these worlds. To use focus lock, you're going to half press and hold the shutter button the same as if you were just going to focus on a specific area of the frame and recompose. But while you're holding the shutter button, you're also going to press the OK button. Once you hit that, your focus is now set to one fixed distance of whatever you just focused on. 
Now, we effectively have the same exact level of control that we'd have in manual focus mode, but we got things set easily using autofocus. You can now record and not worry about the camera hunting or updating focus at all while you shoot. That focus is locked to that one spot. Now, while your focus is locked, you have to be sure not to change your relative distance to your subject too drastically. Otherwise, you are going to have to update your focus to compensate because it's locked to that one fixed distance. To update the focus and use the focus peaking, you can either use the up and down buttons or the top dial while your focus is locked and it's going to push or pull that focus in closer or farther away as displayed in red thanks to the focus peaking. When you're ready to break away and re-autofocus entirely, just hit the OK button again to cancel the focus lock. Now, one potential challenge of using this technique is that while diving with the camera in the housing, it can be a little tricky to feel and hold the half press of the shutter button. If you add in wearing gloves in cold water, it becomes even tougher. The good thing is that the normal point and press autofocus operation is totally fine for most scenes. You really only need to use the focus lock technique in scenes where there's a lot of movement and moving elements competing for focus in the center of the frame, or if you're seeing those focus hunts happen while you record. We can turn on highlight and shadow warnings to provide us with a quick preview of the brightest and darkest parts of our photos. This helps us quickly determine what lighting or exposure adjustments we need to make in order to either darken a background or avoid a blown out highlight on a subject. To activate the highlight and shadow warnings, go into the main menu, then the custom menu, page B, and select the first option. Select playback info and select the checkbox for highlight and shadow. Now, when you bring up your images by hitting the playback button, they're gonna blink blue over the darkest areas of shadow and orange for the brightest areas of highlights. You can use this instant feedback tool to adjust your exposure and light power and position accordingly. The RGB histogram is a graph representation of the brightness of the primary colors in our image. Understanding how to read the RGB histogram is a really powerful tool for dialing in the ideal blue water background color when you're shooting wide angle. The RGB histogram is broken down into the overall luminance and the primary colors of red, green, and blue. The left side of the graph represents the darker, more shadowed tones, while the right side of the graph represents the brighter, more vibrant highlights. When you're shooting wide angle, the goal is to create an exposure that leaves the blue background underexposed from what the camera thinks it should be. This is gonna leave us with a nice deep blue background and help us avoid overexposing and creating a less appealing, more cyan, turquoise toned, brighter background. As we covered in part three with our wide angle photo settings, when shooting wide, just use the exposure compensation dial as a dial of blue background control, taking it from minus one down to minus two stops, depending on where you want that blue background. When checking out your shots, find a blue background result that you really like, and then check the corresponding RGB histogram. Make a mental note of that result and aim for it in the future. When you use both the highlight and shadow warnings and the RGB histogram, you've got all the tools that you need to nail your exposure perfectly in camera with the TG6 on every shot. The TG6 captures photos in either RAW or JPEG file formats. The difference is that RAW photos are uncompressed and can be heavily edited without quality loss, but RAW requires a program like Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop to develop and export those images. JPEG files are compressed. They can't be edited as much, but they are ready to share as soon as they're shot. 
You wanna shoot in raw if you're the kind of person that likes to take your time and do some heavy editing on your photos and is gonna take the time to bring them into a library like Adobe Lightroom to work with them. If you'd rather just do some quick edits, maybe on your phone and then post your shots straight away, then JPEG is really the good way to go. You just wanna make sure you're selecting the highest quality JPEG option, which is the large, fine setting. The biggest reason to shoot in raw underwater is for white balance correction. Even if you don't plan to do any more significant editing on your photos, the one thing you should really do is a one-click white balance correction. This can bring the color tones of your image back up to a much warmer and natural looking level, especially in those ambient light only shots. This level of correction really just can't be done on a JPEG without incurring some quality loss. And there is the option to record photos in both file formats simultaneously, but there's really not much reason to do so. It takes longer to write both of those file types to the memory card, and they're gonna take up more card space than just shooting in one format or the other. So figure out what makes the most sense for you. Rec view is what the TG6 calls the auto image review pop-up that comes up right after you take your shot. By default, this is set to only a half second duration, which isn't really long enough in our opinion to take a look and check for details. What we like to do is go into the setup menu and then set the rec view duration to either two seconds or off. We typically set this to two seconds because that's a good balance between being able to take a glance at your shot or at least determine if you need to take more time to look at that shot, but it's not so long that it creates an interruption in most shooting situations. You can make the pop-up image go away with a half press of the shutter before that two second duration is up if you wanna get back to shooting right away. In instances where you need to shoot as fast as possible, you may find that you like just turning off that auto image review entirely and only bringing up the image to check it out when you decide to. When you have that image up, you can also zoom in and move around the frame while reviewing it to check for critical details. When it comes to understanding the flash and strobe modes, there's really only two things you need to know. There's manual and TTL. Manual means that you set the flash power on both the camera and the strobe, while TTL means that the camera and strobe's flash power are just set automatically. Now, not every strobe out there can do both manual and TTL. Some do both, some only do one or the other. So your choices here might be limited to what your gear can do. There are pros and cons to using each method, so let's fully break them down. The appeal of using auto TTL is that its automatic functionality means you don't have to manage your flash and your strobe power while you're in the water, but it's also not gonna be ideal and perfect for every situation and scene. TTL is gonna work better most of the time for macro than wide angle shots, and TTL, to be honest, is totally fine for beginner and novice shooters or people who just want that simpler overall point and shoot shooting style. To get the camera set for TTL, bring up the flash menu and set the mode to fill in mode. Fill in flash is gonna fire that flash with every shot at an automatic power level. Your strobe also has to be set to its TTL mode, which is gonna make it synchronize with the flash correctly and it's gonna match the flash power coming out of the camera. Now all you have to do is focus and fire and then check out the shot and maybe adjust the position of the strobe to your liking. If you prefer to take more control over the strobe or if TTL is not working for your scene, then you can set the strobe to manual power. Once the strobe is set to manual, you can dial in the brightness, which is handy where TTL underperforms like when you're in a backlit wide angle scene trying to light something in the foreground. Now, technically, we only need to change the setting on the strobe to switch between manual and TTL modes, but there's one more step that we really have to do for the fastest, most efficient shooting, 
we want to set the camera's flash power to its manual power output and that power is going to be 1 64th, the least amount of flash possible. This minimal flash output is really all that the strobe needs to trigger. And it's going to save us a lot of time because we don't have to wait for the camera's flash to recycle that much brighter fill-in flash. It's also going to save us a lot of battery power too. Also, keep in mind, every strobe model is a little different. There's no way I could include the specifics for every one all in one video. So if you are having trouble getting your particular strobe to work with the TG6, just reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you get it sorted out. Now we've explained in previous settings videos that when you're shooting photos, we like using aperture priority mode. This mode works differently on the TG6 than it does on other cameras, and it's definitely some big time camera nerd level of detail, but this is why you're watching the video, so let's break it down and figure out why we use aperture priority mode and how it works. So here's some basics. Aperture is the diameter of the lens opening. This affects the exposure by controlling how much light is allowed through the lens, as well as controlling how much depth of field you have or how much of your shot is in focus. A larger open aperture creates a brighter scene and has less depth of field, while a stopped down aperture creates a darker scene and has more depth of field. This is universally true among all cameras. But here's where the TG6 stands apart. When in aperture priority mode, the TG6 has three aperture values. These are relative to the current zoom level of the camera and they'll change as you zoom in or out. Even though the camera displays three aperture values, in reality, there's only two physical aperture sizes. There's one larger opening and one smaller opening, while the third aperture value doesn't actually change the size of the aperture, Instead, it just uses a drop-down filter to achieve a darker overall exposure. You can see this demonstrated here in some extreme slow motion. You can actually see the filter retract back up from the lens after the shot. No other current compact camera works like this. So what does this actually mean for need-to-know shooting information? You won't actually get more depth of field in your shot by going to that third most stop down aperture value because it's not actually making the physical aperture of the lens any smaller. You're only getting a darker exposure from that value because of the addition of the drop down filter. This is why the middle value makes the most sense when shooting wide angle photos with a strobe or photos with a video light instead of a strobe like we covered in parts two and three of this series. The middle aperture value gives us the best flexibility between having the most depth of field possible while also creating a fast enough shutter speed to freeze motion blur, and it's going to be a bright enough exposure to let us keep our ISO value low to reduce noise and maintain image quality. When we use the third or the darkest aperture value when shooting macro photo with a strobe, like we covered in part one, because the addition of that darkening filter helps to meet our goal of creating the darkest background possible. Now that you know these advanced settings and nuances of the TG6, along with all of our basic settings from the earlier videos, you're fully set for underwater success no matter how you want to use this awesome little camera. Stay tuned for the next video in this series where we're going to cover the best underwater accessories for the TG6. If you have any questions about the settings, the camera, or really anything underwater photo and video, just give us a call, send us an email, reach out to us on social media, and we're going to be happy to help. Your purchases from Backscatter or any of our authorized dealer partners worldwide always include free lifetime tech support, and it helps keep us making more of these videos. Our team of underwater photographers dive, shoot, and service everything that we sell, so when you need help, you're getting it from someone who knows their stuff. I'm Robin from Backscatter signing off and happy shooting.